So, hello, Leute. Um, so, obviously, I will discuss about WebRTC. But it's not so much about WebRTC, uh, but instead of, uh, it's more about how WebRTC allows you to solve real problems. Just focusing on, um, on how you're taking care of the peers instead of focusing on the technology underneath. So, first, who am I? Uh, I'm, known as, I'm known as Tokeshu, which is not a Pokemon name. Um, I work for Mozilla for almost two years now, and my background is mostly about real-time web application. So application that requires WebSocket or event source or long pulling, this kind of features. Um, in the following slide, I will discuss about uh, WebRTC, how you could build an application with WebRTC. So we will dive quite quickly in the guts of the technology, and then we will discuss about higher topics like architecture and um, other stuff. So first, what is WebRTC? Um, WebRTC means real-time communications. So th this is precisely a set of three APIs that allow you to create peer-to-peer -peer application on the web without any plugins and without any extensions. And all is encrypted by design. Indeed, you can't actually turn off the encryption in WebRTC. So the three API are um, Get User Media to capture your webcam and your microphone, Peer Connection to connect two different machines, and data channels that are a subset of Peer Connection. So crazy as it sounds, a Hello World in WebRTC is actually a Skype-like application. So a video chat on the web. And how you would do that is first, you would capture the camera, and that's where you will use Get User Media. So here we, has, we have a simple example. We have a button, and when I click the button, I get a prompt from, the, from my brother, and when I accept the prompt, I see myself. So it's quite simple, actually. Um, so here we see the code, and it's, as I said, simple. You invoke Get User Media, you get a media stream out of that, uh, when it succeeds, of course, and you inject this media stream into a video element. And then you have like a local video a feedback loop. Really, really simple. Once you have the video, you probably want to send it somewhere, because, of course, you communicate. And for that, you will use Peer Connection. Peer Connection is a bit more complicated. So here, we have Alice that wants to communicate with Bob. And for that, Alice will create a peer connection, add the stream to it, and then create an offer and send it to Bob. Offers and answers are descriptions, what we call descriptions, that are used to uh, share information between the two user agents before they actually make the peer-to-peer -peer connections. They are payloads, and I use the term payloads here because in theory, you should not look what is in there. You don't need to change that. Of course, some applications uh, modify that, but for a starter, you probably don't want to modify that. You just consider them as payload to exchange between people. So that's Alice's side. Uh, on Bob's side, Bob's created his own peer connection, but this time, he will set the remote description as the offer. So Alice's local, offer is, uh, Alice's local description is the offer, and Bob's remote description is Alice offers. And he will create an answer out of the offer and send it back to Alice. So quite similar on the both sides. Um, so we have Alice, Bob, and now we come back to Alice, and she will complete the handshake by setting her remote description as being the answer from Bob. Once you have that, you will listen for the ice connection state change callback to see when the connection, connection actually is open and available. So in the code I show you, actually, there is a few gotcha. First, in the current stable release of Firefox, the API is prefixed. So if you want to de um, deploy and write multi-platform application with Chrome and Firefox, for example, you will use a shim, probably. And something that is a classic gotcha when you create a peer connection and want to create an offer, it's always require a stream or a data channels into it if you really want the create, uh, offer creation to not fail. And of course, there is a few callbacks you will have to take care of, the OLED streams that tells you when the remote stream is available. 
the on ice candidate uh, that allow you to share uh, ice candidate to do NAT traversal between peers. And the ice connection state change we saw just before that tells you what is the status of the peer connection. Okay, so now we will discuss about signaling. In the previous code, I used two functions, and what the hell is that exactly? So they are placeholders. They are a simplification in the code where the signaling happens. So that's the piece of code that is responsible for that. Uh, so it's the code you will probably write. Um, so first we will stand back a bit to understand what is signaling. Um, when you want to create peer-to-peer -peer applications, not only on, with WebRTC, but peer-to-peer -peer applications in general, you have to answer these questions. For example, you want to communicate with a machine, but where is the machine in the network? Do you know the IP? Maybe they are behind the NAT. How do you deal with that? And of course, if you want to be secure and private, you probably want to deal with encryption, so how do you deal with key exchange material? And signaling in WebRTC solves all of that by making the peers communicate be before they actually make the peer-to-peer -peer connection. So signaling is not exactly specified in WebRTC. In the sense that there is APIs and the payload that are specified, but the protocol doesn't specify how you should exchange these payloads. Um, so it could be a web server, most of the time it will be uh, on the web, but it could be something totally different, like flashing QR codes, exchanging USB sticks, um, just typing stuff, or SMS, you name it. But it's up to you to build this part. So in the following slide, we see the flow of signaling. So in the following slide, I will, uh, uh, there will be bees all over the place. They are representing peers. Um, and as you see, there is a, bees, a bee with a crone, which is a queen bee, and that's the authority in the network. So here it's a server you have to trust to actually make the signaling. So I recap the code we saw before, the create offer and set local description from Alice. And once you have the offer, you will send it through the server to Bob. And so the server acts as a third component that will mediate the two peers before they can actually communicate securely. And then Bob creates the answer and sends it back to Alice. And then if everything goes right, you should have a peer connection that is completely connected and um, that works well. Okay, so once you understand all of that, which is a big, big chunk, I have to admit, um, you get the basic application you could build with WebRTC, which is a Skype-like application, a video chat. And that's exactly what I did. Um, hi, buddy. Yeah, so yeah, you see a wild Tokesho in the morning. Um, so HiBuddy is a really simple uh, video chat application. The, the concept is simple like many other uh, WebRTC applications. You go on the website, you create a room, you enter the room, uh, it captures your webcam, you share the link of this room to someone, uh, with someone else, this other person enters the room, captures the webcam, and then you're supposed to be connected and you can chat directly. And of course, everything goes encrypted uh, between the two peers and nothing goes uh, through the server at this moment. So uh, HiBuddy was designed to be one-on-one -on -one communications, um, but nothing prevents you to actually have more than two persons in a room. But it was uh, made on purpose. Indeed, if you want to have more than two persons in a room, you will have to pay for the bandwidth, literally. In the sense that if you have more than two persons, you will have to send the video to more than one person. So here we see a full uh, connected graph network where you will send your video as many times as there is n peers minus one in the room. And each of these connections are encrypted, so you will pay for the overhead of this encryption to in, the, in, the, in the channel. So that doesn't work well for a lot of peers, of course, because the bandwidth will bite you. So how can we circumvent that? Can we improve that? So when we think about that, uh, video is neat, but maybe not that much necessary when you communicate. In, in fact, the audio is actually the backbone of the communication. So what if we remove the video part and just keep audio only? That's where we have Balafon that comes into play. So Balafon takes exactly the same idea of high body, but this time applies it to audio only communications. And in fact, you have an arbitrary number of people in the room that creates a full mesh network um, with WebRTC. However, using Banaphone, 
I learned something from the Autopia application. It's not magic. In the sense that building a consistent global user experience which this kind of application is, in my opinion, fundamental. That's why I deliberately stayed on the one-on-one -on -one communication for IBD because I can provide this one-on-one -on -one consistent communication without having some random behavior that corresponds to uh, the variation of your bandwidth, for example. With banana phone, it works well for an uh, end that is low, but once you have too much people, it just doesn't work really well. Because everyone is connected peer-to-peer, -peer, everyone can have a different experience. For example, if Alice communicates with Bob and Charlie, Alice may hear perfectly Bob and Charlie, but Charlie may not hear Bob and only Alice. And you don't know that because it's just peer-to-peer, -peer, so everyone can have a different experience. So Banaphone is, as I said, a full graph network. But to mitigate this kind of problem, you could change the topology of the network. One solution could, could be to use a star topology. So again, we see the queen bee, which is a server that will proxify everything. So this time you only have one link between a peer and the server, and so you send the video once and receive the video once, and the video will be forwarded to other peers, uh, reducing the need for bandwidth on your side. And of course, it causes other problems, because once you have the big queen, the big queen have to support all the bandwidth and, and the encryption too. They have to, the, the queen have to terminate the encryption and forward it. So it's not only uh, load on the bandwidth level, but on the CPU level too. Another hybrid model would be the supernodes model. In this hybrid model, it's between peer-to-peer -peer and the hub uh, topology we just saw. So we still have the big queen, but the big queen has a less costly infrastructure. The big queen will just elect supernodes in the network. Supernodes will be just nodes, random nodes that are more capable than others. The way it would work with Banaphon is for everyone that enters a room, they will perform a test towards the server, the B queen, a bandwidth test. And the B queen will elect the nodes that are more capable in the room and make them proxify everything in the room. This way you could mitigate some problem, but of course you still have the problem to put more load on the super nodes, but you don't pay for the infrastructure, so it could, it, it could solve the problem. However, you still have like other problems like uh, eavesdropping and privacy issues, of course. Okay, so I was fast. Um, so we will recap a bit what we saw until now. So we saw get user media to capture the webcam and the video. We saw peer connection to send data through the wire and the signaling how you make the actual peer connection before uh, by exchanging data. But we didn't discuss about how you exchange arbitrary data. And that's the role of data channels. That's where we will discuss about Wagle.js. So Wagle.js comes from a real simple idea. What I see in the web today is applications like YouTube where you go on a web website and you download a video directly from the server. But there is also people that watch the video at the same time. But we are all in all on bubble, we don't share the, the data despite the fact that we have it. So the server has to be quite big to support a big number of users. What if we could have that? What if we could actually share the bandwidth with all the people that are watching the video? Can I actually share the data with people that are watching the video as I do at the same time? Yeah, actually, that's exactly what Waggle.js is. So the name Waggle comes from the Waggledon's bees uh, performed to actually share information with other bees, information about food, water, etc. And here you see a screenshot. I will show a video uh, a bit later. And so the purple square are chunks of the video that come from the swarm, and the green chunks come from the server directly. And we'll explain a bit more all of that. So the way Waggle.js works is for everyone that enters the web page, they will open a persistent connection to the Waggle server and say to the server they are interested into one particular file. And so here you have two servers. You have the file server that is supposed to be unchanged. So Nginx, for example, that just serves static files. And aside of that, you will deploy a Waggle server and add a script to your web page. And so as I said, you go on a web page, you open a persistent connection, ask for the server because you are interested into one particular file, and you receive the current state of the index. The index tells you who has what in the network, 
who has which chunk of the file. If you're the first person on the web page, you probably, you probably don't have any peers that actually have the data you're looking for. So you will ask it directly uh, to the, from the server with an HTTP range request. And so nothing changes there. You just download the video from, from, from the file server directly. But once you have the chunk, you can claim to have it. So you will update the index um, towards the Waggle server and claim this chunk. And the Waggle server will be in charge to notify every other peers that you have this particular chunk. So once Pub wants this particular chunk, if they want to, they can actually connect to you and ask for the chunk. So here is a video that shows that. Yes. So you go to a web page and you start to download chunks from the swarm because there is already peers that looks uh, for the video. And I will explain why we have green rectangles here, green squares. So the video runs, and you see there is a window of chunks, actually. So the window is of size 10 chunks. So it slides along the timeline like that. And I will stop the video really soon, and we'll see that the chunks will stop download, actually. Here we go. And then everything stops. And I will restart the video, I mean, play it again, and we see that the chunks start again. OK, so once you create such an application, you have other problems. Because we don't have video and audio and low latency communication in real time uh, ish stuff. You have only arbitrary data exchange. So you have new problems. One of them is, what if Mm -hmm. What if um, a chunk doesn't arrive in time? So you request a chunk, but it takes a long time to, to come. And you have to make a smart decision, because you're buffering a video, so the clock is ticking. You have to, to take a decision really fast. So what I did is you request a chunk, but if the chunk doesn't arrive in time, you will request it from the server, because the server is probably a more reliable source than the swarm at this point. And it doesn't mean you will close the connection with the peer, because maybe in the first time you tried to download a chunk, you were doing the WebRTC handshake, which is quite heavy. But the next time you will require a chunk from this person, the connection will be one. You just have to send something. Uh, so next time, maybe you won't reach the timeout. That's the way you could uh, solve such a problem. To mitigate this first problem of having chunks that have to be delivered quite fast, I introduced the notion of quorum and unreachable peers. So the quorum tells you that instead of connecting to one peer and get a chunk out of it, maybe it will fail. You don't know. Maybe the person is not, you know, is bored. The cat in the, in the video was not cute enough. So they just, you know, close the web page. They disconnect, basically. And so you were about to make a, an, a web about to see handshake, but the person is, you know, not there anymore. So you will sit there and wait for the timeout to be reached and ask it from the server. So instead of doing that, you will actually try to connect to multiple peers at once and request the same data to all of these peers and hope that one of them will actually uh, forward use the data in time. So here we see a quorum of two, two peers. And in the current version of Wagle.js, the quorum is of three. There is also the unreachable peers notion. So if you want to connect to a peer, sometimes the peer-to-peer -peer connection doesn't work. So instead of trying to request every time a WebRTC handshake from them, you will actually time out this person and say, OK, I sent an offer, an offer and they didn't answer, so I consider it uh, unreachable. Maybe they are still in the network, but I can't reach them directly. So I reach a timeout, and I exclude them from the peers I will look for in the future. Then not spending my time trying to um, time out on the offer um, exchange. OK, so we are not there. So we discussed about a lot of things. It was a bit dense, maybe. Um, so we discussed about, again, get user media, peer connection, signaling, how you create such an application on web RTC, like video and audio communications, how you would actually solve problems that are related to uh, architecture. 
and arbitrary data exchange with Wagle.js. And I want to highlight the fact that at the beginning we were like, you know, discussing about code, but actually most of the discussion was about how you solve the problem. So it was more about how you create the peer-to-peer -peer application and how you solve the problem than actually taking care of the peer-to-peer -peer underlining network. And WebRTC is exactly that. It enables you to write peer-to-peer -to -peer application without thinking too much about the peer-to-peer -peer network underneath. Make you essentially a virtual beekeeper. So I encourage you to look at the code. It's all free software on GitHub. You can read the code. It should be fairly simple, except maybe for Wild.js, uh, because it's quite you know, hairy. But the code should be straightforward, quite easy to understand. And I encourage you to read that, learn from that, and come comes with your own crazy ideas. And please change the web as we never did before with WebRTC. Thanks. Reject.